Hey, welcome back. Today we have a Shaolin 102 compound slide on the healing bench. Uh, this is the compound slide of a relatively well-made, uh, <laughs> I should say brilliantly well-made, uh, mid-sized instrument maker of lathe. Uh, Schablin, Swiss company of course, still around, still making small instrument makers, lathes and uh, CNC lathes. And this doesn't belong to me obviously because I do not own a Schablin. Um, this is a customer part or piece. So um, why is this here? Um, it's worn and it has another issue that I will go into. The problem with most slices is that they wear uneven. Um, in this case, as you can see, I can crank it nicely along. It's almost a bit too loose, but when I get to the to the other end of the travel here, it binds up. That means that the dovetail down here on this end is worn. It's narrower than over here. Um, and we will measure that, of course. So what this series of videos will be about, this will be a complete rebuild of this uh, compound slide, uh, starting by taking measurements, deciding where to scrape, do the scraping, fit a new gib. Um, this is a tapered gib, newly supplied from Schaublin, um, but it's not matched. Um, you have to match it yourself. So we will do that too, and we'll get everything done and um, do the check, uh, final check after we are done too. So have, no, I, I hope this will be a very com comprehensive uh, series of, of videos on this topic. Um, so first we have to take this guy apart, of course, because otherwise we cannot do very much. Over here we have a screw which seems, okay, this holds the bushing, the end bushing for the spindle. This is actually a very nice design. This is an Acme screw in here and it's it has a, a main bearing over here with, as far as I can tell, two angular contact bearings over here. And it's also a bushing over here, so the spindle is nice and rigid in there. We do not want to mess the screw up, so we will look for a screwdriver that's a very good fit. Otherwise, we will chowder up the screw. Uh, that's not an option with a customer part. <laughs> uh, people don't like if you uh, ruin their screws. Same if, if you have to pry or lever something, use brass or copper. I have, for example, a small brass pry bar that I can use to get stuff like this end bushing out. I'm not sure yet how all this comes apart. These screws for sure hold the nut in place. Okay, now we should be able to pull out the gib. And with the gib out of the way, we can take off the lower part of the compound here. Yes. Um, that's actually a very common design for a, a tapered gib adjuster. A screw with a, with a ground collar. And there is a slot in the tapered gib where the, where the collar of the screw engages. And this is a very tight fit. Uh, there is no axial movement of the gib on the screw. And now you can also see that, that one of the two gibs is a little bit longer. 
because this one has a broken end. And we can pull off this lower slide. First glance it doesn't look too bad, but uh, I can see uh, some wear here on this side. There comes the spindle assembly. Now we just have to unscrew the nut and we have it all apart. I'm not going to mess with the, with the bearing setup here. Um, I think this is good, good as it is. I will check it when I get it all back together, but for now, I guess, we don't have to do anything to it. Um, also, the, screw, the nut feels very tight still. Apart from that, a little bit of axle play in the nut doesn't kill anybody. Um, you work in an approach direction anyway on the lathe. So backlash is not a terrible issue. Um, interesting fact, the, the nut is cast iron. Um, being a Swiss machine, I would have guessed that this uh, would be uh, bronze. Okay, there we go. That's the one, shoveling 102 slide taken apart. So now it's time to look at the individual parts. This is the, the lower side of the compound which bolts to the cross slide of the shoveling lathe um, via these two holes, I guess with bolts and a T-slot. And I marked the area. Um, I, took my, I took some stones and I very carefully uh, cleaned and stoned the whole surface. And as you can see, um, around this mounting hole we have two highly polished areas. And that's where the, the mounting bolt that mounts this to the cross slide. Um, pulled some materials through. Um, while it's mounted on the lathe, that's not a problem because um, it's riding in this um, circular T-slot and around the screw hole there is uh, clearance, of course. But when we go to the surface plate now, we want these high spots to be stoned off flat to the rest of the surface. Otherwise, um, this will mess up our measurements because um, it's like having a pivot point where it can uh, <laughs> uh, tip over on. So we have to stone, to really uh, clean and stone these very careful before we go to the surface plate and do any actual real measurement. So we clean it with alcohol, take our precision ground stone, make sure it's cleaned off. And we can really go, um, we cannot go too far with these stones because they just stop cutting. This is the beauty of the uh, precision ground stones. Uh, with normal stones you would have to be ultra careful not to alter the surface. As you can see there are no scratches from the stoning. There is still the original grinding. It looks like a uh, Blanchard ground with a, with a cup wheel. Okay, I put it on the surface plate and I took a one hundredth of a millimeter, 0 0.01 millimeter um, dial test indicator and I mapped out the parallelism of these surfaces. These are the flat part of the belt tail. This is where the the compound slide rides on. And as you can see we have, um, I just I, I just take one area as zero like uh, here, this is my zero, and from there out I map the remaining surface um, out, plus or minus. Um, obviously to the end of the travel or to the end of the surface um, it's worn. It's uh, minus two, minus three, minus two, minus one. So it's actually the surface has is like this. It has a, a hill in the middle and it's dropping on the ends, which is very common. A very common uh, mode of wear. Um, you will not. You will. <laughs> you will basically never see. Um, 
the short part of a dovetail slide being worn in the center. That's basically not happening. And this side over here actually is a little bit higher. This is plus two, this is plus three compared to this. But it's also dropping to the end of the surface. So just by looking at this, um, this is this is easy. Um, these two surfaces we can just surface grind perfectly parallel to the bottom surface and then just scrape it for bearing. We do not have to do any geometric scraping on these two surfaces, <laughs> which is nice because it's fast. <laughs> okay, this is the other part of the slide. This is the longer part. Sitting on a surface plate. And first thing I, I check is if it hinges properly. That will tell me if it's rocking on the surface plate or doing anything stupid that messes with my measurements. So hinging is simple. You just take one end and you try to spin it and you you try to identify the point around which it rotates or hinges. And if it's about one third um, of the total length to the inside, um, you can be pretty sure that the part is relatively flat. Same on this side. Yeah, this looks good. Um, I will later blue this up, but it, it feels very good. You can also take a plastic hammer And listen, if it makes a rattling noise when you hit it, you know that it's sitting hollow somewhere. But this sounds very solid. Okay, uh, I checked the wear on this one too. And out here on the end, it's, it's zero. There is also the original grinding uh, marks of, of shoveling to be seen, so I can take this as my zero and as you can see it goes down on this side minus two and then back up to zero. That means it's exactly the opposite of the shorter part. It's worn in the middle and original on the ends which is also a very common mode of wear for the longer part. Um, same on this side this is heavier worn. Um, zero, zero, minus four, minus six and it goes back to three. Um, so this is also hollow in the center and a little bit low on this end, but basically both sides worn in the center mostly. So <laughs> already we know a little bit of, about the part and this helps us to decide what we're going to do. I already know what to do. <laughs> um, with, with a dovetail slide, it makes sense first to scrape the flat part flat and parallel to whatever you want it to be parallel. In this case, you drop your pen and then you scrape it uh, to the top side of the, of the slide because when you move your slide, you do not want to have this, this surface here change its height uh, because it won't change the center height of the tool you have put on it, like a turning tool. Uh, that would be quite annoying. Then we scrape the, the dovetail parallel. That means we scrape one side parallel, for example, to one of the T-slots or to the outside. I have to check which is accurate. Um, then we scrape the second side parallel to the first one. Then we take the lower part, we scrape the flat part, or in this case with a surface grind, the flat part, and just scrape it for bearing and match fit one side of the dovetail to the, to the longer slide. We use this as a master for this. And then we have to fit the gib into it. Okay, I just blued the straight edge I'm going to use for the for the compound slide up. I did this a few days ago and I just want to see 
if it moved because this is just a continuous cast cast iron just like durabore and it has not stress relieved by having it sent out to a heat treater so i have to be a bit careful um, and watch and monitor it if it moves but uh, i rang it a few times hanging it up and hit it with a, a mallet um, during straightening and it didn't move very much so I guess or hope that it's relatively stable. I measure the width of the dovetail by using pins and a micrometer check the width over the overall overall length and it's uh, about 0 0.15 millimeters of wear from end to end which is quite substantial I would not have suspected that much wear but it is like it is we have to deal with it um, but the measurement of, of the width of the dovetail is not reliable until these surfaces here are flat. Otherwise you introduce two errors at one time. So first thing we're going to do is we're scraping the flat part of the long slide, of the long part of the slide, these surfaces on both sides flat, parallel to the top and preferable to the same height. It's not absolutely critical that these two surfaces are at the same height to the top surface, but it makes life a bit easier, at least in my mind. Um, and to do the scraping, it's hard to do this with the bi with, with a power scraper um, because you always um, hit the end of the dovetail with the scraper. So I have to do this by hand. And I, may, I cut me a second set of of wooden V blocks on the bandsaw out of this dreaded um, uh, wood, and this allows me to rest the slide very securely and clamp it with the large wooden clamp here. So, this is a very stable setup. Um, <laughs> the only thing that's going to move is the table I'm working on. And now I can rough up the surface here, and I already can, can use my numbers here. Um, for very rough roughing. Um, I will scuff up the whole surface or break up the whole surface so, so I can take a bluing. But I will hit um, the ends. Uh, I will hit this end here and this end here heavier or at least uh, twice as often as the center. The center is the lowest point minus six and minus five. And uh, there are 0 0.05 millimeters uh, height difference between the end and here. So um, we already can bring this down without much measurement. We also have to be very careful. Um, down here is a ridge. It's worn up to here and behind it there is unworn surface because that's where the um, tapered gib slides and the tapered gib only touches the, the angled part of the dovetail not the flat part of the dovetail brought the camera in a little bit closer i hope you can see this ridge back here about here there should be a shadow line uh, visible on camera i just realized when i moved the camera around the way I look at it, it's easier for you to see. Um, here is the edge. Behind here it's unworn and here it's all worn. I have to take this knife edge stone and grind a heavy chamfer on the edge here so it, so it doesn't bind up in the relief down here. Um, just pre-handing it against the diamond wheel. Hmm. 
Okay. Um, now I'm loosening up the clamp. So this part sits freely in there and is not distorted by the clamping pressure. Then I take my uh, blued up straight edge, place it in the dovetail, um, making the lower edge of the triangle hit first and then tipping it in like this. And then I move it back and forth to rub the surface. So still what I expect. Um, it's hitting hard down here, hitting hard here, hitting relatively hard here and here. Center is relatively clear. Um, we still have a little bit of contact here on the ridge. So we, we will heavily rough down all these these areas, this, 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 this and center here is, uh, we're not going to touch this. We will take this one pass and before we get carried away, we'll go to the surface plate and take a few measurements. So we do not uh, do anything stupid there. And as you can see, I, I take really heavy cuts right now. Um, I'm making real chips, not dust. And now we hit the ridge down there again, because it's still a little bit high. And clean it. I'm using some alcohol because I have all the, the scribbling of mine over there. Okay. Um, I took another bluing after the last scraping pass that you saw, and we get somewhat of a contact um, over the whole length. But now we have to check. So this uh, this narrow surface here does not get tipped in or out like this. It's not super critical because we will match fit the other part to this one, but it's easier if it's parallel. Um, in my mind, it's easier to keep stuff parallel and flat and rectangular than to match fit everything. Makes it easier to measure too. Um, it's easier to measure twist in this part or in the surface when it's parallel, <laughs> when it's uh, on an angle. And it gets really hard. I mapped the surface out with dial indicate, dial test indicator and the gauge block. The gauge block is there to span the, the holes of my scraping, especially as the scraping is right now super, super rough. Um, if you run an indicator along it, you get <laughs> you get seasick. Um, for each position, I have two numbers. Uh, this one is always out to the edge, and the upper number is inside here at the inner end of the dovetail. So we start over here at zero, and we drop by five hundredths of a millimeter down, which is okay. Um, that's not terrible bad especially as it's um, a very even drop. Um, we're not going up and down like crazy. It's already kind of straight, so um, we will step scrape it. <laughs> uh, kind of step scrape it. Um, we will hit, we'll divide it into a few like this. Um, one time, two times, three, four, and out here five times just without um, measurement in between, just to drop it down. Okay, step scraping works this way. Um, we start out here and uh, square that one time scrape. We'll scrape the whole surface, then we will start over in this square, leave this one untouched, scrape everything. Then we start here three times, scrape everything. 
start here, scrape everything, and then scrape the last one a fifth time. That way we will bring the whole surface progressively down, tipping it down. We will imagine this li line here acting like a hinge, where you just move down the whole surface. <laughs> so let's go. Okay, now we flip directions and go that way, starting in the second square. <laughs> Second square done, now we change to the third one and change direction again. Change direction again. And one last time for their last square. There we go. Now we clean it, stone it, and see what we have. Generally, step scraping is a good way to remove a whole bunch of material in a relatively short time. And the chances of messing up are relatively low. Okay, with only this one uh, scraping pass, we got it down to from zero to minus 300. So it's almost uh, double as good as before, <laughs> which is good. Um, what we also can do, we can compare it to this side now. And this side is roughly, yeah, Mr. Fumblefinger. Um, 300 of a millimeter higher than over here in this worn area. On the end, it's more. Yeah, it's 500 of a millimeter over here. So the surface is in general lower than this, which is good because we can just move this down later. Okay, I did some more work to the surface, and as you can see, uh, or hopefully can see in the camera, um, I'm way beyond the roughing phase. This is almost going into finishing scraping. Um, I got a bearing over the whole surface, maybe 10 to 15 points per square inch. And it's also parallel, very parallel to the top surface. So for now, I will leave the surface alone and I will draw my attention to this side and I will bring it down to be leveled with this side. And then we're on a very good road. <laughs> um, once we have those two surfaces, we can measure the parallelism with the pins. Okay, I measured the first side that I scraped and it's zero to zero from end to end. And it's about uh, five microns tilted to the inside. So it's, I can fix that during finished scraping. But it wouldn't matter too much because, uh, yeah, it's uh, five, five, six microns. Really not that much. Um, <clears throat> but right now I'm measuring the other side that needs to be scraped now. And it's uh, 0.07 to 0.08 millimeters higher than this side, which is good because we can take it down now. Um, <laughs> uh, we would have a problem if the surface was lower. The, because then we would have to scrape this flat and then we would have to bring the surface that we already scraped br uh, bring it down too so double the work um, so be careful where you start to scrape <laughs> and as before I'm just using gauge block and my interrupted dial test indicator to compare side to side 
what I'm going to do is um, I'm again step scraping. I'm going to hit the center here two times. One time this time this direction, one time this direction to scuff it up. And these other areas here three or four times. Uh, I, I think four times. Not two. That's uh, <laughs> that's okay because uh, we have to remove a lot of material anyway. Um, seven hundredths of a millimeter. Uh, we can go pretty crazy on this. But while roughing, you have to be a bit careful not to, to knock the surface completely out of alignment. Otherwise, you create a lot of extra work. And who, who, who likes that to do <laughs> extra work that's not necessary? Me. Me not. So, I'm going to hit the whole surface two times now, and then the ends two times extra. <laughs> A lot happened um, since the last uh, scene. I completely, um, yeah, completely, I, I scraped these two surfaces here, the parallel surfaces. I semi-finished them. They they still need work. They have uh, they have even bearing, but it's not very nice. And um, they are within tolerance, all within way less than one hundredth of a millimeter. And yeah, I consider those um, reference surfaces now for, for, the, for the moment. And I took the base, which was worn on the ends and high in the middle, and I surfaced around the top just to get the major of material. And it's uh, indicating now 0000, zero, zero, zero um, because my grinder grinds pretty straight uh, since I rescraped the table. And yeah, uh, that's already a major hurdle because I just have to scrape this for bearing now. Uh, but that's later, I just ground it to have it off the table. Um, and now it's time to do the dovetail. I will start with one of the dovetails and align it with the side, with one of the sides of the of this uh, cross slide. The cross slide, I already checked it. It's nice and parallel ground. And the, the T-slots are also perfectly in line with the outer dimensions of this, uh, of the top slide. So I can use, I, I, I very carefully stoned the side here, which has a lot of ding marks. Somebody used, obviously, uh, something like a chuck key or, or something else hard to knock it into alignment for adjusting. You see that often on, on old used lathes. Uh, some people are a bit... I hope it's not the, the owner that's using the machine now that, that, that who did that. <laughs> um, please don't use steel on cast iron to get stuff aligned. <laughs> um, yeah, so now the task is to, find, to take one of the two dovetails and scrape it parallel to everything else. And to measure it, I just take a um, dial pin. Dial pins are a bit... Uh, uh, dangerous uh, almost. Um, they're generally not perfectly round and not perfectly straight so I cut me some uh, carbide round stock um, old L and mill shanks down and I use those just for just for a <laughs> peace of mind. So and the trick now is uh, there, there is no trick we just um, drop the pin in the dovetail We find uh, top that center by sweeping the indicator across the pin like this. This is top that center almost. And I really like the interrapid indicator. It's it's incredibly sensitive for. Um, for a one hundredth of a millimeter indicator, um, not a problem to see five thousandth of a millimeter on this guy. <laughs> and then we indicate the other side. 
and it's 500 of a millimeter low, so minus 5. All my numbers at the moment are in one hundredths of a millimeter increments. 0.01. <laughs> so somebody um, said that there are no uh, <laughs> fractions in metric, and of course they are. Um, you have one tenth of a millimeter, you have one hundredth of a millimeter, and you have one thousandth of a millimeter, and so on and so on. But they are all base 10. 10, 100, 1000, and so on. Not 16, 30 second, 64. So there are fractions. So yeah, that's minus 5 here too. So I'm mapping out the, the wear of this one dovetail now. It's minus 4. Minus four. This is the front end, so it's more worn on this side than on this side. And here we are already at minus two. And here it's uh, zero. And out here it's also zero. So we go from zero to minus five hundredths of a millimeter. That's not too bad. Um, I probably can step scrape this in one or two passes pretty close. Okay, I already did some scraping to the dovetail surfaces, to the angled surfaces, and um, there are two ways how you can measure. Uh, there are more ways, obviously, but I have two ways of measuring. I can either take this thing Drop everything. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, that was carbide. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, once you have dropped everything successfully, you can take two pins. In this case, again, the carbide pins, and just mic over it and look for the uh, largest dimension. Uh, takes a bit of practice and a bit of feel how you manipulate the, uh, the micrometer and find the high spot to get the right drag when you sweep over the pin, but it works very good. But there is another way, which I probably like more. Um, you need an angle plate or a box parallel, a, a bunch of parallels uh, of normal size, and uh, two additional pins, uh, preferable ones that you do not drop all the time. and you. Put the pins into the angled dovetail and let the pins rest on the parallel. And the parallel sits of obviously on the surface plate. And the part itself is backed up against the, the box parallel here, so it's nice and square to the world. And now we can just drop in a, a pin and we can very easily sweep top that center of the pin of the diameter of the pin with the indicator in the surface gauge and map the, the dovetail that way, which I find um, it's a bit more set up, but it's, I think it's, it's more precise. Mm -hmm.